the first time I met Pastor Steve, I was still in uh, grade six. And uh, I was part of this church. <laughs> it's okay, Pastor Steve, I'm just 33 now. So. But there was one message that resonated years ago uh, when, I, when I first stepped into this church. In fact, my very first church was Victory Makati at Makati Sports, the first generation Makati Sports Club. Right? And there was one message that resonated, which was really the next generation. And as a 13-year-old watching that, I said, one day I want to be really part and take an active role in this uh, local church and in this family. And as, we, as I grew older, as Tammy and I got married, had kids, if there's uh, really one of those prime examples of as we get to know them and have a front row seat of their leadership and how they do things, how they do family, all the more we were impressed. Some people you're impressed from afar, right? Like my face, they were from afar. Looks good, right? You come nearer, it's better. No, 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 no. no. But really, Pastor Steve and Deborah, as we get to know them, as we see their leadership, we saw, wow, how they built the church where it's not about them, it's about Jesus. And how it's about the next generation and giving platform to the next. That really, uh, in a way, really has blessed us so much and changed us. And uh, Pastor Steve, as you all know, is our president of our Every Nation Ministries, overseeing so many churches around the world. Yet, uh, again, just his time for the next generation and for us here in Manila, uh, we are really, really thankful for that kind of humble and godly leadership. So I want us to be ready today as we hear from Pastor Steve. Let's all give a warm Victory Mahadi welcome to Pastor Steve Murrell. Pastor Dennis, and I don't see Tammy yet, uh, maybe other service, but anyway, I am so grateful for your friendship and your leadership. And a lot of people love to do the work of the ministry. Not many people want to carry the weight of the ministry. And your pastor carries the weight of the ministry not just for Makati. But Dennis, thank you for the way you have led not only here, but all over Metro Manila and in our nationwide and throughout the Asia region and the way that you have carried about leadership. It's an honor to work with you and this is an honor to be here with you. So thank you, Pastor Dennis. Can we give him a look at it? Um, This is an incomplete picture of my family. We have a new grandchild, I think my my uh, the wife of my youngest son was pregnant in this picture so we have nine grandchildren and uh, for those I, I know we just heard someone talking about maybe the uh, listen it gets better and better the older you get I'm 64 I'm approaching middle age right now and middle age is good I refuse to be a senior um, I have three sons, all born and raised here, and live many, much of their life here in Makati. Three daughter-in-laws, and as I said, nine grandchildren, and one wife, whose Dennis is dressed like her today. Um, my middle son, wife is Japanese. She was born and raised in Tokyo, lived there her whole life. Now she lives in Nashville, Tennessee, and that is another planet, not just another city from Tokyo. And it's kind of a weird thing that she goes home to Tokyo to visit family, and then she leaves Tokyo and goes home to Nashville. Um, my youngest son's wife is Filipina. Her Lolo and Lola migrated from Nueva Ecija to America more than 60 years ago. And when I'm with Lolo, he feels like the province is his home after 60 years in America. But when he's there, he doesn't really feel home because much of his family is in the U.S. My wife and I lived in your nation for 24 years. It was a great privilege from God and privilege to raise our children here. Um, it's kind of weird because a week ago we came home to here, but in some ways it's not home. But when we're in Nashville and when we leave here, we will go home to Nashville. 
and there will be something missing. All of my sons feel that way. They were born here. They went to high school. They were born in Makati Med, all three of them. Uh, they all three went to high school in Antipolo. Then one by one went to college in America feeling like foreigners. And they would come home here, but they're not Filipino and they never will be. But yet they're not fully feeling and thinking like Americans. Do you ever feel like you don't really belong? You sort of do, but you sort of don't. No matter how much we accumulate in this world, no matter how many friends, no matter how much money, no matter how many uh, cars or whatever the thing is that kind of makes you feel good for a moment, there's always something missing. And I don't mean just for non-Christians. I mean for believers. I mean for, for Holy Spirit filled all in serving Jesus Christians. C.S. Lewis summed up that feeling like this, if I can read my own handwriting. If not, I'll try to read it from the screen. I might do better with that. If I find, my in, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Today's sermon, today's text, is not about this world. It's about that other world. That we will never fully have everything functioning properly until we get there. But so many of us try to make this our eternal home. And no matter what we do, we come up empty. And I'm going to tell you why today. Turn with me in your Bible, and I'd like to ask you to stand up. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. You can op just hold your phone. Don't turn it on and pretend like there's a Bible in there. <laughs> or you can look at the biggest Bible in Makati on these beautiful screens, okay? Revelation <clears throat> 21, and we're going to read verses 1 through 8. And it was... I found this fascinating. People are preaching this text all over the world in 80 nations today in our Every Nation family. I was on the phone with my son uh, who's pastoring a brand new church in Nashville. This is his sixth Sunday, brand new church, and he's preaching this text. And while he was putting his kids to bed and trying to get them to bed, we were chatting a little bit, driving here with ways telling me I'm turning the wrong way uh, about this scripture, about this other world that we are designed for. Here we go. Revelation 1.21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the springs of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. This is the word of God. May the Holy Spirit open our eyes, our minds, and our hearts to understand and obey 
In Jesus' name, amen, you can be seated. Now, some of you have probably tried to read Revelation and either got scared, confused, or bored, and stopped. Um, this is not an easy book to read, understand, preach, or listen to, but let me give you the key to reading it properly. Go back to Revelation 1.1 and the very first five words. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That was more than five, not this is. The revelation of Jesus Christ. It is self-describing. Uh, ice is counting that. The revelation of Jesus Christ. There you go, five. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Then that God showed to John the things that must soon take place. If you read Revelation looking for monsters and beasts and Antichrist and uh, 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 666 people and all of this bizarre, mostly made up stuff that, uh, that um, uh, prophecy teachers talk about, you're reading it wrong. It's not a revelation of that. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. Re it's revealing Christ. If you read Revelation to find Christ, you will find him. And you'll understand it. Also, if you read Revelation, realizing it is the most biblical of all books in the Bible, meaning that Revelation quotes the Bible constantly. There are approximately 500 times in these 22 chapters where there's a reference to another place in the Bible. There's an exact quote. There's a reference. There's a story. There's imagery. And so sometimes we get confused in Revelation because we don't really read the Bible and we don't know the Bible very well, so we don't know what it's talking about with the Bible imagery. So focus on Jesus, read it in the context of the whole Bible. It'll make sense. Now, when I'm, I'm going to give you, um, you know when you go to a restaurant, they give you a menu, but they don't give you the recipe. So you don't know what's in there or how it got there for better or for worse. I'm going to give you my menu right now. When I'm, when I'm studying the Bible, when I'm reading, and especially when I'm reading for a sermon, I've got a picture. I put these icons on the top of my page to remind me what I'm doing. You have that little thing with that stick figure? Is he on there? Where'd he go? I think you guys made it look better. I, I, mine was, I don't think they realized it was a person, so they fixed it. I put this guy up there to remind me when I'm reading scripture, it's going to describe the human condition what people are really like. The Bible reveals what people are like. Secondly, I put a triangle. And that triangle is uh, uh, to remind me, Bible, the Bible is also speaking of our triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's what that triangle pictures to me. And, 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 and what we're going to find in Scripture is the human condition on the one hand, but the nature of God on the other hand, how God interacts with humans. And then thirdly, I put a cross at the top to remind me that the gospel solution, when there's a human condition and there's God's nature, how does the gospel solve the human condition? All right, I have never in my life, decades of studying and teaching and preaching the Bible, seen a scripture that so lines up with that as the one we're looking at today. So I had to, I had to tell you, Pastor Dennis, that's, that's where we're going. All right, here we go, the human condition. If we look, um, I, you see up there the word death seven times in this passage we're looking at and the few verses prior. Seven times you have death or dying or dead. All right. And John was seeing dead people everywhere. He's having this vision and he's describing what happens. And it is, it is a little bit scary. If you back up to chapter 20 and you start seeing this now, I have a picture. I, do you have that picture? I, I took this last Sunday when I first got to the Philippines. When we landed, what I do in the Philippines is when I get here and I'm jet lagged, I go into um, what used to be my son's bedroom. Now it's my study. And my view looks out over that is the American Manila Memorial Cemetery. And I open the shades at sunrise and I have a reminder of the fragility of this life, of the certainty of death, the hope of the resurrection, and the coming judgment day. Why? Because that's my view. I'm looking out over that from my apartment in BGC, 
And what I'm, what I'm looking at are 16,859 graves, dead people there. All of those little white dots are either crosses or a few stars of David. And there are people who died in World War II, Americans who died in World War II right there. They're buried there. there I'm also looking at, you can see that circular white part on the left of the screen. On that, there are 36,286 names of dead people, but they never found the bodies. They died when submarines were destroyed or ships were sank or airplanes crashed into the ocean during the Battle of Leyte Gulf and others. I'm looking out and my first thing every morning when I'm here is a reminder of death. I know this isn't a real happy sermon right now, but Hang on. I'm grateful for that reminder. I'm grateful that I get to wake up and I'm reminded that this world, whether I'm in Manila or Nashville, is not my real home. This is temporary. But there's an eternity waiting for me. And therefore, whether my life is going the way I had hoped or not, this is very temporary. This is preparation for eternity. So I'm looking at that. I'm thinking about chapter 20. And verse 11 speaks about the great white throne judgment. Uh, verse 12 says, and I saw the dead, great and small. Great and small, that's not tall and short. Great and small, that's wealthy and poor. Powerful and no power. Educated and not educated. Uh, seemingly uh, famous and important people and people that nobody knows. And you know what you find out? Dead people, great and small, are standing before the exact same judgment day. There's not two different judgments, one for the rich and they buy their way in and one for the poor. It doesn't work that way. There's not two different measures of eternal judgment, one for the rich and famous and educated and powerful and people with all the stuff and all the power here on earth and those with none of that. There aren't two different lines. There's not a way to uh, either speed up or slow down this. It is the exact same for everyone. And he says, I see these dead people, great and small, standing before the throne and then books are opened. And there's two books. It doesn't clearly say what's in the first one, but it seems like it's everything we've ever done, thought, should have done, didn't do, uh, wanted to do. Did, uh, it's all there. And then it says there's a second book, and it's the book of life, and it says this, the dead were judged, the great and the small, judged by the same standard. The dead are judged by what was written in the book and what they had done. Remember this phrase when we get to the end of this sermon. Around 2 o'clock. Remember this. Judge by what they had done. Judge by what they had done. And then it says the sea gave up, gave up the dead. And then it says there was death and Hades gave up the dead. And it says again, they were judged. Each individual was judged. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And then we see this idea of the lake of fire over and over it just keeps repeating this lake of fire. I, I, I don't know. That doesn't sound good to me. And then he calls it the lake of fire the second death. We die once physically, and then we die. The second death talks about this eternal death. There's a temporal death, and there's an eternal death. Then we get to verse 21, chapter 21. Then I saw the new heaven. So here's, the, here's this judgment stuff in chapter 20. Then we get to 21, there's this new earth, a new heaven, and new, 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 new. But what is the human condition? What is it? It's described here as death. And I would add this, death by sin. Genesis chapter 2, in the garden, God says you can eat anything you want. The first commandment God gave was everything is yours. All of it. He commanded, eat all of this, but there's one tree. If you eat it, you will surely die. Everything else is yours, and so guess what we want? Humans are the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you've raised kids or grandkids, you know whatever's forbidden is what they want. 
And if you are not a kid or a grandkid and you're somewhere in the middle, then you know that what every one of us wants is what's forgiven. What forgiven? What's forbidden? Jet lag moment, not a senior moment. The human condition is one of sin and death. So, that's bad news. What is the nature of God? What does this speak to us? What does this text tell us about what is God really like? There are a lot of distortions of God out there, all kinds of religions that make up gods, many, many, many gods. And within Christianity, there are a lot of misconceptions of what God is really like. Let's look at what this says. What is God really like? And I want to zero in on verse 3 of chapter 21. And this word dwell. The nature of humanity is death by sin. We're all going to die. And then comes a judgment. But what is God like? Verse 3. This loud voice came from heaven and it said, The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God. The nature of God is to want to dwell with humans, to want to be with us, to want to have his presence with us, to have a relationship with us. That's the story of the Bible. It starts in Genesis, this idea of God dwelling. Genesis 3, chapter verses 7, 8, 9, around there. And when, when man has sinned, when Adam and Eve ate the one thing they weren't supposed to eat, they could have eaten everything else there, this huge just buffet everywhere they looked. And they got the one thing that would kill them. What did they do first? They covered it up. Then they heard God walking in the garden. And they hid. What we tend to do is sin, cover it up, hide, and run from God. Some of us run to religion to hide from God. Some of us run to all kinds of vices to hide from God. Some of us run to Good work, some of us run to vices. Some of us run to addictive behavior. We run to all kinds of places trying to hide and trying to assuage the guilt and trying to get that sense of not belonging here to somehow shake it. And all the while, God desires to dwell. And we see that throughout Scripture. When man sinned and hid and ran, God pursued. God's walking in the garden saying, Adam, where are you? God knew where he was. He wanted to give him a chance to answer. Where are you? Genesis, we find God seeking to dwell with man. Exodus, toward the end of Exodus, we find God giving instructions how to build the tabernacle, where his presence would be. The book of Leviticus is all about the regulations of how to get close to God in that tabernacle. Over and over the Old Testament, from the beginning in Genesis, the message is God wants to be with humans. He wants his presence there. He wants relationship. When we get to the book of Judges, we find over and over people are rebelling and making idols and they're going into idolatry and they're going into immorality and then God will send a judge and they'll turn back to God and then it'll last a little while. He'll pour out his blessing and then once again they turn to idolatry and immorality and then God pursues them with another judge and they turn it around and God pours out his blessing and then there's another one and another one. It's just this cycle for hundreds of years of man running and God pursuing. You can take that through the whole Bible. David sins against God with, with all kinds of moral and violence and all this stuff. And God pursues him. He sends his prophet Nathan. Go see if you can turn this guy around. It's what God relentlessly pursues. The ultimate pursuit happened in Bethlehem. What we celebrate as Christmas now, Bethlehem is on the east side of the West Bank in Palestine. Where Jesus was born. God coming in human flesh to be with. He, and he was prophetically called Emmanuel, God with us. God wants a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with me. He wants to be with us. He wants to dwell, not just occasionally visit. Some visit God every Sunday. That's a good thing to do. But he wants more than this. This is really good to be here today and to sense his presence. But he would like to see you more than once a week on Sunday at the Diamond 
residency. He wants to dwell with you in your life, in your home, 24-7. The nature of God is to see. The human condition, condition, sin and death. The nature of God is to pursue so he can dwell with us. The gospel solution, we drop down to verse 6. And it's summed up in this word, done. I know this isn't good English, but it really comes down to who done it. Whether we're going to have a relationship with God. If you look back at the verse I referred to a while ago, chapter 20, verse 12, it says that the people who experienced the second death, they were judged before God by what they had done. If we take everything we have done on Judgment Day and pile it up to God and say, here, I go to church, I'm a good person, I've helped the poor, I've just whatever the list of all the good things we have done, and we pile it up there, you know what happens? Second death. Eternal death. Because that's not how this works. How do we know when we have ever done enough good? It's not a big scale. Okay, there was three years of bad and two and a half years of good and then a month of really, really bad and then a month of super good and, and it's this big scale. That isn't the way it works. But it's centered in this word done. Maybe I could say it like this. This would even be worse English. Who done what? How about that, How about that Dennis? If we stand before God based on what we have done, like these people in chapter 20, verse 12, we're in trouble. But look at what it says in verse 6 of chapter 21. And he said to me, this is the one who's sitting on the throne. He said to John, the guy having this vision, he said, it is done. And it's sort of John quoting himself. John's quoting himself. John wrote this and John wrote the book of John. And John 1930, the way he said it then, commenting on the cross, it is finished. And there he says, it is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, to the thirsty. And again, he goes back to quoting himself of what he said about Jesus on the cross, when he said, I thirst. And then he says, I give from the spring of the water of life. That's John quoting himself in chapter 4, verse 14, the woman at the well encountering Jesus. And Jesus said, look, if I give you water of life, you'll never thirst again. And he starts explaining salvation to this woman. He's quoting himself in the scripture all through. But the key to it is this next phrase, without payment. This water of life, this symbol of eternal life. He didn't say, look, when you get up here, you bring what you have done and we'll measure that out and see if it's enough. What this voice from the throne says is, it is done. What he said on the cross is it is finished. And what that means is it is all paid. It was, it was an accounting word, tetelestai in Greek. It was an accounting word. It is finished. All the accounts are balanced. All the bills have been paid. There is no more debt. It's been paid off. Finished. Wouldn't that be great? It's not let me see how much he's done and bring that and let's see. No, finished. Done. But who did it? Us or Jesus? And what he says, and the key is this, without payment. Without payment. That's a reference to Romans 3 and verse 23, where, where Paul said, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life, not based on your works and what you have done, the free gift of eternal life in Christ because of what he did on the cross. Now, a lot of people preaching, and I'm wrapping up now, a lot of people preaching this text today. I don't know why, but a lot of people ended at verse 7. Actually, I do know why. Because we really want to make people happy. But this series is on holiness. And God is more committed to our holiness than our happiness. And so we just can't leave off verse 8 because it messes up what the message of Scripture really is. And here's the clear message. 
when we die, there are two different eternal destinations. There's the lake of fire that he talks about over and over and over. And some people go, oh, but that's just a metaphor. There's not a real lake of fire. Okay. Okay. That's great. I accept that. If that's what you believe. Okay. It's just a metaphor. But let me talk about a metaphor. If I have a picture or a story of a perfectly ripe Philippine mango and the real thing. Which one is more powerful? It's the real one. I can try to describe it. I can describe a beach to you, but being there is so much more real. And so, okay, maybe the lake of fire is a metaphor, but the metaphor is always minor and sub and not really the reality of the thing. So what that tells me, it's worse than that. Only two destinations. Verse one through seven explain the new heaven and the new earth and we get there not because of what we have done but because of what Jesus did on the cross it's a free gift of salvation and then the other destination is described right there in verse 8 and most of chapter 20 the lake of fire metaphor or not it's a second death September 11th on 911 I was in my home in Valley Verde, talking to my dad. It was evening here. It was morning there. My dad's birthday is September 11th. We were talking on the phone. And then he goes, are you watching this? And planes were crashing into the buildings in New York, and he narrated it for me on the phone. Two months later, he was in ICU. Never forget it. My sister calls. He's in ICU. He flatlined. He died. And then they revived him. I didn't know this, what I'm about to tell you, until four months later. He revived, he went home, he was a different person. My sister would say, something's happened to dad, it's really strange. He is not the same person as he was before. Never drank again. Changed in his, it, it, just, let me just say, radical change. Nobody knew. I was in the States in January the following year, a few months later, preaching in our new church in New York City. My brother called me and said, Dad's had a relapse. He's in the hospital. He won't make it another 24, 48 hours. If you want to see him, get on the next plane. I preached. I got on a plane. I flew, went straight to the hospital. He had tubes all down him, and, and he, could, he, could, he was conscious, but he couldn't talk because of the tubes. I shared the gospel one more time. Saw something I'd never seen in my dad in my life, tears coming down his face. Uh, see, we were, my dad's from Texas, and I grew up being told men don't cry. That's, that's a Texas thing. But I realized sometimes our eyes sweat. His eyes were sweating. Mine were too. I prayed with him. After sharing scripture, praying with him, I took my mom downstairs, got in the elevator, went downstairs to get something to eat. As soon as we got downstairs, my brother who stayed behind called and said he just died. The next day, five siblings were all together. My youngest brother, as we're going through the will, my dad's every detail of the will was there. I mean, everything down in detail. He would meet with us every year and go, hey, here's what I've changed. Here's what, you know, it, it, he was very, he, he made it a lot easy, really easy for us. My younger brother, he said, Steve, did dad ever tell you about that weird vision that he had when he, when he died, when he flatlined uh, months ago? I said, no, what? Here's what my dad, when he got out of the hospital after flatlining, he told my younger brother, he said, when that happened, now this is my dad who was, I guess the best I could describe him was an agnostic. He used to mock preachers. That was sort of his hobby. He tells my brother he came out of his body and he's looking down. He didn't believe in this kind of stuff, okay? And he's looking down at the doctors, frantically trying to, you know, bring him back. He looks over at the heart monitor. It's flatlined. He realizes he died. He turns around. This is, this is what he told my brother. He turns around 
and he's face to face with what he perceives as Jesus. He can't see his face because he's just glowing. This is going to be weird right now, okay? Some of you, it's going to be cool. Some of you are going to, that's heresy. He's holding in one hand a Bible and the other hand, Bacardi rum. That's how my dad made most of his money. He was the marketing director for 28 liquor companies. Bacardi was the biggest. And he was his best client. He told my brother, he said, I knew in that moment I had one more chance. I knew in that moment I had to make a decision. The word of God or the thing that's destroying and the thing that has driven my life. And he said, I immediately reached out for the Bible. And when I did... It was like, shook. he was back in his body, opened his eyes, and saw the doctors, and then they started congratulating themselves for what a great job they did. <laughs> they had no idea there's another world where the real things are happening. I appreciate doctors. If you're a doctor, I really thank you for keeping us alive. But you can't do it forever. Most people don't get a second chance like my dad did. Most people don't. I got to tell that story at his funeral a few months after it happened with a room full of his drinking buddies, gambling buddies, and all his, I mean, it was, they were, their mind was blown. They were, you know, they did, who is that? I don't know where you are. I don't know where you are physically. I don't know where you are in this. You're going to die, you will. It's just a matter of time. Some of you soon. Some of you, it's going to be a while, but it's going to happen. And then we're going to stand before that great white throne of judgment, before a God who has done everything that can possibly be done to pursue us, to have a relationship with us. And then we're either going to take the things we have done and say, look at all that I've done. I deserve this. And then the bottom's going to drop out. Or we're going to go and say, what Jesus Christ did on the cross for me is where I put my faith. I plead with you. Don't run from him. Don't run from him to church. Stop trusting in what you do for him and put your faith in what he's done for you. That's what Christianity is. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are a God who loves us and pursues us. And we are a people who are sinful and run from you. Lord, may this moment we have today cause us to stop and turn and put our faith in you. Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself in a powerful way today. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Steve, for that word. Is it okay? I felt like the Holy Spirit is leading us into something today as we end the series on holiness. Some of you might be in church for the longest time. You've heard messages like this. Some of you, I know already. I know that's. I, I know what's going to happen. But I really want you to think hard of where you are with God. You know, it's so easy to say, oh, I'm pursuing the things of God, and I know this God. But it's another to reflect and see how you live your life, where you are. And I believe the Holy Spirit wants to minister to us today. And I want us to be in an attitude of prayer. Can we just close our eyes and pray? And Again, we don't know where you are today. But if you're here, you're saying, Lord, I want to surrender my life to you Lord I choose you Lord for the past few months as we have been talking about holiness the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you maybe today's your day of surrender today you say Lord I surrender to the Lord you're saying I'm open for an encounter with God I want to receive the gift of God in my life And I know you've heard the messages. And I know you prayed through some of them. If you're here today, you're saying, I, I believe today's my day of decision. 
today I decide to follow Christ. Turn back from my sin. Repent of my sin. And follow Jesus. Okay, just lift up your hands. We're going to pray. You're saying, that's me. Yes. Just lift it up high. Yes, 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 yes. The Spirit of God is speaking to you. Just lift up your hands. If that's you, you can be a long-time member of this church, but it's just today you're saying, Lord, I'm making this decision to repent of my sin and follow Christ. Just lift up your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can we all stand up right now? If you're lifting up your hands, all right, can I ask some of our small group leaders, just lift up your hands, right? Those who want prayer, would like you, would like our small group leaders to approach you. Let's pray now. Okay, just continue lifting up your hands. Father, we thank you for my brothers and sisters who are making this decision today to follow you and to repent of our sin. Lord, we're crossing over from death to life. Lord, you said that you will dwell among us. Lord, that you will dwell in our hearts. So today, Lord, we come Lord, we receive your gift of grace, your gift of love and of holiness. Lord, we repent of our sin. If you know you have sins in your heart that you need to repent of, can you do that right now? I want you to take this time to repent of your sin. And say, Lord Jesus, I'm turning back. Turning away from sin and turning to you. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you. Because all throughout Scripture, from the text that we read in Leviticus, and how, Lord, you've overcame God, and even removed all the steps so that we can enter into your most holy presence. Lord, today we're making that decision. We repent of our sin. And we surrender our lives to you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your great gift of love. Thank you for your death on the cross that saved me. Thank you for this message today that reminds us of a greater option. To follow Jesus. To surrender our lives and walk with you. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody say, Amen, Amen.